Welcome high school teachers. In this course we're going to be looking at curves from the ancient world, the ancient Greeks, all the way up to the modern world of Bezier curves. And we're also going to be looking at making some concrete constructions using GeoGebra. Curves are of interest to high school students because they appear in such a wide variety of interesting situations and because they are very historically uh, very interesting. All right, so the story begins with the ancient Greeks, as does much of mathematics, who are interested in curves for geometrical reasons and also for astronomical reasons. Their favorite curves were the simplest ones, the line and the circle. But they also, of course, investigated a bunch of other ones too. In particular, they studied the so-called conic sections, which arise when we look at combining the circle and the line to form a three-dimensional cone. So here is a cone, like an ice cream cone, but as Apollonius realized, it's good to consider the top and the bottom of this cone. All right, so here's a cone, and if we slice this cone with a plane, then we get what's called a conic section. So for example, if we slice it with a plane, perhaps in this direction here like this, then we can get an ellipse. And if we slice it with a plane, perhaps oriented like this, then we can get a hyperbola. And if we slice it with a plane which is actually parallel to one of the generators of the cone, say a plane something like this, then we pick up a parabola. All right. So the, uh, the ancient Greeks, in particular Apollonius of Perga, 200 BC, he introduced the parabola ellipse and the hyperbola as conic sections. In other words, as slices of a cone. But Apollonius also had other ways of thinking about the conic sections. In particular, he understood the conic sections as metrical objects. In other words, as things that you could obtain by looking at ratios. So here's an ellipse. And an ellipse can be obtained by a point and a line. A point called a focus, say F, and a line L called the directrix. And the crucial issue is that if we look at a point X, which has the property that the relationship between the distance to the focus and the distance to the line is always a fixed constant, then we pick up, well, either an ellipse or a parabola or a hyperbola. So if we're looking at the distance xf to xl, so here's the distance from x to the focus, and here's the distance from x to the line l, measured perpendicularly. So if that's, say, uh, epsilon, then we get an ellipse when epsilon is less than 1. If epsilon equals 1, we get a parabola. And if epsilon is greater than 1, we get a hyperbola. But there are other ways of thinking about these conic sections, too. Here are two other constructions of an ellipse. This one is very familiar. It's actually very possible to use it practically to actually create an ellipse. You start with two fixed points in the plane. You get a piece of string and attach the string from one point to the other. And then you tighten the string by putting a pencil there and tightening it. And then as you move your pencil around, keeping the string tight, 
the point x will traverse an ellipse, which has f1 and f2 as the foci. So that's called a Gardner's construction. Another physical kind of construction is due to Archimedes, sometimes called a trammel construction, where you have two fixed axes and you have a rod which is hinged so that it's allowed here to move this point A on the vertical axis and the point B is allowed to move freely on the horizontal axis, but otherwise the, uh, the rod has uh, this fixed position, can't, this distance can't change. So as A and B move, maintaining their separation like this, this fixed point X, which is also on this rod, will traverse an ellipse. Okay, the ancient Greeks were interested in motion because of a very important astronomical reason. The motion of the planets in the night sky was very mysterious to them. If you look at, uh, say, something like Mars over a period of days, it will make a motion something like this. It kind of loops back in a retrograde motion. So this was a big motivator for the ancient Greeks, in fact, all ancient peoples, to understand or try to understand what was going on with the planets. Of course, a very important historical problem. And was one of the reasons why curves were interesting. So the ancient Greeks also considered some other constructions of curves that are also sort of geometrically linked to physical processes. So there's a fellow called Nicomedes, who also lived around the time of Apollonius, around 200 uh, BC, who investigated curves which he called conchoids. And the way you get uh, something like that is, here's an example, so suppose that you have a fixed line and you have a fixed point, and you consider variable lines going through our fixed point, And you agree that on the other side of this line, you're always going to go a fixed distance. Okay? So you're going to go a certain amount from the line to another point there. That same amount over here, that same amount over here. And then the curve that you're going to uh, obtain from these points here will be something like this. And that curve is called a conchoid. Another kind of uh, interesting curve, which was studied by Diocles, also a contemporary of Archimedes, more or less, is a cissoid. It's a sort of a generalization of the conchoid. So what we have here is we have two curves. Let's say a circle and a line and we're considering a fixed point, say that one there. And we're looking at lines through this fixed point. And that line, any one of them, will intersect our two curves in a point there and a point there. And then what we do is we take the little vector that joins those two intersection points and translate it down to our fixed point that we're starting with. That's over here, we would have intersections here, and there would be a longer vector, and we move that down so that it's um, based at our fixed point here. And then what happens is that the, the locus, or the path of these little vectors emanating from our fixed point, will trace out a curve that looks something like this. So that's a, a cissoid. Another very important kind of curve is what you get when you roll one curve on top of another. So for example, if you have a circle, and you have a second circle, which is, say, rolling on top of the first circle. 
there's a circle which is rolling on top of the first circle. Then if we look at a fixed point on our rolling circle and look at its trajectory, well, we're going to get some kind of a path maybe that looks a little bit like this. All right. And that was called an epicycle. And that figured, that kind of curve figured very prominently in Ptolemy's uh, understanding of his theory of planetary motions. So the ancient Greeks had a lot of interesting curves and interesting constructions for higher curves from simpler ones. But when the 17th century rolled around and calculus was discovered and Descartes' Cartesian geometry was introduced, there were a whole new range of possible ways of thinking about and understanding and playing around with curves. And some important new curves were studied. The 17th century was a very exciting time for mathematics. Descartes and Fermat introduced the idea of coordinates into geometry, so this Cartesian revolution where we could then study curves using equations. The calculus was invented or discovered by Newton and Leibniz and developed by many other mathematicians including the Bernoulli family. Newton came up with his laws of motion, which gave us very concrete way of calculating motions of things. So the 17th and 18th century people were very excited about the ability to understand motion in a way that people hadn't been able to before. As a result, lots of new interesting curves and aspects of curves developed. One curve that was particularly interesting was a very close analog to the epicycle of Ptolemy, where you take a circle and this time you just roll it on a straight line. And then if you follow a point on it, then that point will make a curve called a cycloid. And this was a very important curve that figured prominently in several key problems in, uh, in the 17th and 18th century. In particular, how to find a curve where you can roll a ball from one height to another down in the fastest way. That turns out to be an inverted cycloid. Other important uh, kinds of curves were obtained from a mechanics by thinking about motion. In particular, there's a very famous and important uh, curve which we all recognize as the infinity sign. And this is the lemnus skate. Okay. There's different kinds of lemnus skate, but the most famous one is attributable to one of the Bernoullis. And this was uh, obtained geometrically in the following construction. There are also two special points called the foci of this lemnus skate. And then what one does is one takes a mechanical arm of a fixed uh, length and two fixed lengths equal and then another uh, arm uh, joining them and these are allowed to revolve around these uh, joints here and the actual dimensions have to be carefully chosen so uh, if this one is the uh, middle one is L which is the same distance as the distance between the foci, and if these two over here are L over uh, root 2, then as these rods rotate around the fixed foci, the midpoint of this segment will trace out the lemnus gate. Okay, so this kind of uh, motion was generalized in the, what's called a four-bar coupler curve, where we have four bars, one, two, 
three, four, and we have joints here which are free to move, and we're assuming that this bottom bar here is fixed to the ground. So we're allowed to rotate here and here, and this thing is also allowed to be a rotational joint. And then if you fix a point on this middle bar, then its curve, well, it's depends on the relative lengths of these various bars, what you actually get, but it traces out an interesting curve called a, a coupler curve. And more generally, if we attach a, uh, say a triangular plate to this middle bar, then we can choose any point on it and see what happens to it. We will also get a, some kind of curve. Uh, that's a, a coupler curve. So these kinds of uh, things ended up being quite important in, in industrial applications. For example, James Watt used this kind of, uh, kind of device to convert rotary motion to linear motion uh, in his steam engine. Okay, so we had uh, uh, interesting mechanical uh, devices, but we also had an important algebraic innovation due to Descartes and Fermat. And that leads to the idea of an algebraic curve, which is a different way of thinking about what a curve is. In the 17th century, besides the important developments of the calculus and Newton's laws of motion, we also had Descartes' introduction of coordinates or Cartesian coordinates into geometry, which revolutionized the way of thinking about what geometry was. It's all very familiar these days to students. We've all seen the x, y axes many times, which allows us to introduce a pair of numbers to say what a point is and to specify where it is. But it also allows us to introduce the idea of an equation, say like this one, x cubed plus y cubed plus 3xy equals 0, to specify or represent a curve very important idea that the equation and the curve are really two aspects of the same thing. A point on the curve satisfies the equation and something that satisfies the equation is necessarily a point on the curve. This is a particularly uh, interesting curve that Descartes himself studied called the folium of Descartes and it's a cubic curve because the polynomial that we have here is degree 3. Okay, so this allows us to introduce all kinds of new curves. In particular, if we have a function like y equals 3x squared minus x plus 2, well that's a quadratic function which determines a parabola. If we have a degree 3 function, like y equals x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4x minus 7, something like this, then we expect a cubic function, which has not quite the complicated aspect of this, because there's only a single y, so it's simpler than this kind of thing. But it's a, a cubic function that has some kind of shape like this. Okay, so in the 17th century, this was a, a big development. The idea that we could introduce uh, equations for curves and that we could study things using uh, equations and basically algebra instead of geometrical or mechanical ways of thinking about curves. And of course, this was just the start of many important uh, developments leading to algebraic uh, geometry, especially. Uh, blossoming in the 19th and 20th century. It's a little bit remarkable that uh, a very key new development for curves only occurred relatively recently. So in the late 50s, early 60s, two French engineers discovered a completely new and original way of thinking about curves. These engineers were Paul de Castellau, 
and Pierre Bézier. And this remarkable new way that they discovered about thinking about curves goes back to our previous course on Archimedes and the law of the lever and barycentric coordinates. So that's the next thing that we're going to be looking at is this remarkable new theory, a relatively new theory of so-called Bezier curves, which has all kinds of applications in the modern world from astronomy to typefacing, computer graphics, design, many, many things.